Hi, I'm Rob Lyon and welcome to workshop 4A where we're going to be talking about anatomy and physiology. Specifically, we're going to be talking about how as fitness professionals we use anatomy and physiology in our everyday practice uh, as well as how we can use it in regards to writing programs for clients, maybe dealing with injuries and then we'll also cover some of the basic movement terminology and directional terminology that you'll need to understand. So let's get started. The first thing we want to talk about today is how a fitness professional uses anatomy and physiology in their everyday practice. It's really important to understand that you know anatomy and physiology is the basis of everything we need to learn because without that we're really directionless and clueless in terms of training clients. So what we need to understand is that anatomy and physiology it is a language. You're going to be learning names of muscles and bones and joints and how things move. Uh, for some people there is a lot to learn. Uh, unfortunately Unfortunately, it's one of those things where you just kind of have to memorize it. You know, we, we don't like putting together courses where you have to memorize a lot of things, but this is one area where you will have to try and commit a few things to memory. So make sure that you take your time as you go through, uh, go back and forward, and it really is a language. So I want you to start to use this language in a lot of the everyday uh, environments you come across or with your own training as well. It's really important to understand that anatomy and physiology, understanding it contributes to training with correct technique because you know which are the right muscle groups that are to be used, you know which muscle groups are going to assist with the workout and also for injury prevention and skill development. So we can use the our understanding of anatomy and physiology and how muscles grow and recover so that we can get injured less and also so that we can improve some aspects of our skills, maybe get faster or stronger or more powerful. So for that reason having this basis of anatomy is really important. Okay, so let's get into some of the directional terminology. So the directional terminology is where we're discussing how uh, things are in relation to each other within the body. So the first thing we're talking about is the superior. So when things are superior within the body, it means they are towards the head of the body. So you may say that the chest muscles, the pec muscles, are superior to the quadriceps or the thigh muscles. Opposite to that is inferior. So obviously inferior is going to mean away from the head or in a down direction from the body. So again, using the same example, you might say your quadricep muscles are inferior to your pec muscles. The next one is anterior. So what anterior means is towards the front of the body. So using a similar example, we might say that our pec muscles are anterior to our back muscles or our lat muscles. The opposite of that is going to be posterior. A good example of posterior you might have heard before is the concept of the posterior chain or perhaps the glute muscles. So the glute muscles in the lower back and the hamstrings, they're all at the back of the body or the posterior side. The next one is medial, and what medial means is towards the midline of the body. So imagine yourself perhaps being cut in half, and uh, medial would mean it's towards the midline or the middle of the body. So a nice example of this might be one of your quadriceps muscles on the inside of your knee is called the vastus medialis. So medialis meaning medial, medial meaning towards the midline of the body. Now the opposite of that is going to be lateral. Okay. So lateral is going to mean towards the outside of the body or away from the midline of the body. So a good working example of this might be in the gym, you've probably performed a lateral raise before where you lift your arms out to the side. That is obviously an example of a lateral movement. The next one we're looking at is proximal. So what proximal means is towards or nearest the trunk or the midline again of our body. So if we were to compare joints, you might say that your shoulder joint is proximal in compared to your elbow joint. Okay, The opposite obviously is going to be distal. So distal means away or further from the trunk. Again a nice working example if we use the same one is that your elbow joint is distal from your shoulder joint. The last two to understand is peripheral which is means on the outside 
and central, which means in the middle. The best example of this is you have two different types of, uh, or parts of your nervous system. One is called the central nervous system, that includes your brain and your spinal cord, obviously being in the central part of the body. And then all the nerves that branch out from that area are what we call the peripheral nervous system because they are on the outside when we compare it to central. So in the next slide we've got a few practical examples. Uh, the first example is looking at the difference between anterior, remember in the front, and posterior at the back. So we use the knee for this example. There's a ligament in the knee called the anterior cruciate ligament. Um, this is the, one of the most commonly injured knee ligaments. Typically if you're gonna like land and rotate or you might get tackled or have an outside force on your knee. And that sits in front of the posterior cruciate ligament, okay? So anterior is sitting in front and posterior means it's sitting behind. Another example, as I discussed before, is the vastus medialis, which is the quadricep muscle that's on the inside, okay? This is a very important stabilizer of the knee joint. It's also got like a teardrop shape where you might see it or notice it in some, in some athletes or clients or even in your own leg in the bottom of your quadricep. It's commonly underdeveloped in athletes with a history of knee issues. So typically athletes that have a weak muscle on the inside of the knee, they tend to get injured a lot. It sits towards the midline compared to the vastus lateralis. Okay, lateral again meaning on the outside and that's the overpowering outer muscle on the quadriceps. So the, the muscles on the outside of your thighs that give the thighs that shape. Okay, the last example as I discussed before, the peripheral nervous system which are the nerve branches that branch out from the central nervous system. So that gives you the difference there between peripheral and central and those peripheral nervous system uh, branches, they act as messengers sending signals to and sending signals back from the central nervous system. Okay, so now that we've discussed directional terminology and we know where everything is in relation to each other within the body, let's go through movement terminology. So this is gonna to relate to your joints, okay? And talking about how different joints move. So the first movement terminology we're looking at is flexion. So flexion is decreasing the angle of a specific joint. So the best example of this would be if you're doing a bicep curl and you're curling the weight up, because the angle of the elbow joint is decreasing or getting smaller, we're doing what's called elbow flexion. The opposite of that is going to be extension. So in extension, you are increasing the angle of the joint. So if we use the same elbow joint as an example, if you're doing, for example, a tricep push down on the cables, as you push that weight down, because you are increasing the angle of the joint, you are taking that elbow joint through extension. Abduction, so that's A-B-D, abduction means we're moving away from the midline, okay? So again, from the middle of the body, we're moving the joint away from the midline. Using that same example as before that lateral raise, okay, we are abducting the shoulder joint. So we're moving that shoulder joint away from the midline of the body. Now the opposite of that is called adduction, and that's with 2D, so ADD, adduction. The best way that I remember it is think about when you're adding, you're bringing it back to the midline of the body, okay? So you're adding that joint back to the body. So if we were to lower the weight in a uh, lateral raise, then we're going through shoulder adduction, or if perhaps we're performing a chest fly in the gym where we're bringing our arms together, that's called adduction circumduction. So circumduction is a combination of a bit of everything. So it's a little bit of flexion, a little bit of extension, a little bit of abduction and adduction. Now typically the joints with the biggest range of motion like the shoulder joint and the hip joints are the joints that go through circumduction. So if you were to do arm circle, swing your arm around clockwise or counterclockwise, because you're taking your joint through all those ranges of motion, you're doing what's called circumduction. The next one we're looking at is inversion. So we're looking at the ankle joint and specifically the foot. Inversion is when you move the sole of the foot towards the midline of the body. So imagine that the sole of your foot is pointing inwards, okay, so inversion, foot pointing inwards. So a classic example of that, we've probably all rolled our ankles at one point in our life. So when we turn over our ankle on the outside and all the weight goes onto the outside of our ankle joint, we go through what's called an inversion injury. The opposite of this is eversion. So what eversion is, is when we're moving the sole of the foot 
away from the midline of the body. So we're turning the sole of the foot outwards, out to the side. Number eight, horizontal flexion. So horizontal flexion is movement of the shoulder in a horizontal plane towards the midline of the body. So to understand this, what you need to do is you need to lift your shoulders out to 90 degrees, so take them out to the side, and if we were to bring our arms in this position to the midline of the body, think about a chest fly or a pec deck machine in the gym, that's what we call horizontal flexion. Of the, body, of the shoulder joint. The opposite of that obviously is going to be horizontal extension and that's movement of the shoulder in a horizontal plane away from the midline of the body. So you might do these if you do for example bent over lateral raises in the gym or you might do what's called a band pull apart to strengthen the muscles between your shoulder blades. So that's in the horizontal plane we're looking at flexion and horizontal extension. So let's go through a couple of practical examples. Okay, the first practical example is the shoulder. Because the shoulder is what we call a ball and socket joint, which means there's a ball of the shoulder and it sits within a socket in the, in the clavicle and the acromion. So what happens here, because this ball and socket is very mobile, it can move in a lot of different directions. So it can move in flexion and extension, abduction, adduction, circumduction, everywhere, okay? It's a very mobile joint. But as we will discover, because it's very mobile, it's also not very stable, which means it's a high risk of injury. The last one is the knee. So the knee is a classic hinge joint, just like the elbow. Because it's a hinge joint, it's only allowed to go through flexion and extension. So think bending and straightening your knee. Because the knee typically only moves in these two movements, it's very susceptible for injury for what we call lateral forces. So you might have seen it before where someone's got their leg planted on the floor and their leg gets taken out from the side. And because their knee doesn't bend in that direction, because it only flexes and extends, that's where we tend to run into some problems there. The next topic we're going to cover are some of the systems of the body and specifically we're going to look at the different types of physiological adaptations that exercise brings in the body. Uh, to me this is a very important part of understanding anatomy and physiology because you really need to understand how exercise changes things like the skeletal system and the nerves and the muscles and the bones. So let's get into it. So the first one we're going to look at is the skeletal system, so our bones. So look, what does exercise do to our bones? So we know that exercise, particularly resistance training when we're lifting weights, is going to improve bone mineral density. Okay, so our bones are going to get stronger. Now our bones get stronger for a variety of reasons, but the two main reasons why our bones get stronger through exercise is the first one is gravity. So if we are loading the bones through gravity, so think about impact exercises like running or jumping or things like that. Because gravity is going through our bones, our bones are going to respond to that by getting stronger to withstand that, those forces. The second part or the second reason why bones get stronger through exercise is because when you lift weights, the muscles that are attached to the bones, they actually pull on the bones. So the muscles are connected to bones by tendons and when the tendons pull on those bones, that sends a signal to the bone for the bone to actually build and to get stronger. Okay, so it's very important to understand that the most important part of resistance training, especially for people that have problems with their bones or bone density or maybe even older clients, is that strength training, resistance training and impact activity will help to strengthen your bones. The second one we're going to talk about is the nervous system. So the nervous system is responsible for sending signals to basically everywhere throughout our body. If we want to look at this from an exercise example, we'll talk about the fact that the nerves will send signals to our muscles, um, telling our muscles to contract at a certain speed or a certain force for us to perform exercise or activity. So when we exercise, the body responds and adapts and the nervous system becomes more efficient at sending signals to our muscles to tell our muscles to contract. And this is really important. You're going to hear a lot about improvements in efficiency in the body. So what does that mean for the nerves? Well, it means a few things. It means that the nerves send signals faster. So from the central nervous system down through our peripheral nervous system and into our muscles, it will send faster signals, which means our muscles have a better response time and can contract. 
The rate at which we fire, we fire them faster. We also recruit more motor units, and what that means is we recruit more muscle fibers because we send more signals through our nervous system. And then over time, our body becomes more and more efficient, so our movements become smoother and more controlled. We've all experienced this when we've learned a skill for the first time. After, after practice and doing the same skill over and over again, things become easier. That's because the nervous system becomes smoother and more efficient at sending signals to our muscles. The next one is the circulatory system. So the circulatory, circulatory system is talking about blood flow and oxygen delivery from our heart and our lungs to our muscles. Now exercise is really important for this system because what it does is it forces blood flow into certain muscle groups. Okay, And when it forces blood flow into certain muscle groups, think about a cyclist. A cyclist is on his bike or her bike, pumping their legs, using their quadriceps and glutes and hamstrings. So because there's more blood involved, your body is gonna send more blood from your heart and lungs to those working muscles. Now, what does that mean? That means that the heart's gonna have to pump harder, the heart's gonna have to pump faster, you're gonna have to breathe more heavily and you're gonna have to breathe quicker so that you can get more oxygen from the air, pump it through the bloodstream from the heart and get the uh, oxygen into those working muscles. So that's why exercise is so important because it improves blood flow and oxygen carrying capacity to your muscle cells. The next one is the muscular system. So the muscular system is gonna to respond to exercise a few different ways and this is gonna be dependent on what you decide to do or how you decide to train that system. So for example, if you are doing a lot of high repetition exercises, you're training for long periods of time, your muscles are gonna respond and get more endurance, okay? Which means it's gonna take them longer for them to fatigue under stress. If you do a lot of heavy weight lifting or if you do a lot of uh, high intensity type of training, your muscles might become a little bit bigger and get a little bit stronger, okay? All of these adaptations to exercise are designed to make the muscles work more efficiently so depending on the type of training that you're doing you'll be get bigger you might get stronger you might get faster all the muscles might become more endurant the last one is your respiratory system so the respiratory system as I mentioned before is in relation to your lungs so your respiratory system is responsible for getting oxygen from the air that you breathe in and getting it into your bloodstream so your heart can pump it to your muscles. So from long periods of time and over time when we adapt to exercise, we become more efficient at breathing. So that means that we breathe more air in with each breath. Okay, that will mean that we get more oxygen from our lungs into our bloodstream, and that means we get more oxygen to our muscles. So certain things will improve, things like our breathing rates, things like our lung capacity, and we also develop the ability to move more oxygen from the little air sacs at the end of our lungs, called alveoli, into the bloodstream itself.